one of the things that we philosophers have to get used to is that some of the most important thinkers, some of the people whose ideas make the biggest impact on philosophy, were not themselves philosophers. Among them, I've put six of the most obvious and most uh, important. I wonder how many of you can identify them uh, all just from their pictures. On the left, of course, we have Isaac Newton, and then Einstein, and then Freud. The fellow on the lower left, you probably, many of you won't know, but that's Kurt Gödel, the mathematician. And next to him is one of my particular heroes, is Alan Turing. And then I put B.F. Skinner up there, too. His ideas have been very influential, whether, whether for, for, for good or for ill. These are, these are scientists, all, whose ideas have made a big difference to the way philosophers do their work and how they think about the big questions, about, about the meaning of life in the end. But the number one philosopher who wasn't is Charles Darwin. And of course, I would say that because uh, people know that I am a, a rabid fan of Charles Darwin. They even sometimes go so far as to say that I try to imitate him, try to look like him. I, I don't know why they would say that. I, uh, I, I'm sure there's nothing in it. But in any case, a few years ago, I wrote a book called Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Evolution and the Meanings of Life. And after the book came out, a lot of people asked me the question, well, why is Darwin's idea dangerous? You think it's a wonderful idea. I said, yes, if I could give a prize for the single best idea anybody ever had, I'd give it to Darwin. Ahead of Einstein, ahead of Newton, ahead of everybody else. I think he had the single best idea anybody has ever had. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. But now the question is, why is it dangerous? Well, people don't ask me that question quite so often today as they did a few years ago. Maybe it's obvious why the idea is dangerous, or a little more obvious. But I'm going to say why I think the idea is dangerous anyway. And I'm going to ask you to imagine, would it be dangerous if, let us say, tomorrow, the people in Great Britain started driving on the right? I think you would agree it would be mayhem. There would be accidents all over the place. It would be a really dangerous place to be, because they've been driving on the left all these years. And you might think that switchover is so dangerous that it would just be impossible. But you know, not so long ago, back in, on a Sunday in September of 1967, the people of Sweden did exactly that. In a single day, they switched from driving on the left to driving on the right. Very few accidents. I don't know if there was any fatalities. It worked beautifully. And it worked beautifully, of course, because they planned for it. And they did it all in unison. They held hands and they took the step together. And even though there was a lot of opposition in various quarters in Sweden, they didn't let you know, the people of Uppsala say, well, you know, here in Uppsala, we're going to do it our old traditional way. If you don't mind, we'd like an exemption. No exemptions. Everybody goes at once, and then it isn't dangerous at all. Now, if the Swedish civil service could have organized and planned for the reception of Darwin's great book on the origin of species, maybe it wouldn't have been so dangerous. But in fact, of course, the book landed on people's minds and people's lives uh, like a ton of bricks. And from the very outset, there was a tremendous amount of anxiety and hostility and fear. And of course, fear often leads to dangerous reactions, and that's why Darwin's idea is dangerous. Well, why was it so dangerous? What is it about the idea that makes it so dangerous? Well, it's a bit like the situation of switching from driving on the left to driving on the right. You're used to one way of seeing the whole world. And now you're told you have to sort of invert it. Well, in the case of Sweden, after it's over, and you catch your breath, you realize you can still go everywhere you used to be able to go. All the places are still there. They're just as wonderful as ever. You just go a slightly different route. And I think the same thing is true about most of the ideas that Darwin's idea interacts with. It does revolutionize our worldview. But once it's revolutionized, 
the world is pretty much the same. Most of the things that we treasure and that we love are, are unchanged or only slightly adjusted by the impact of this amazing idea. Well, let's see what the idea is. And a good way to see it, I think, is to, is to go to the Sistine Chapel and then to zoom in on the central panel. And here we see uh, Michelangelo's wonderful portrayal, really, of the creation of Adam and putting the spark of meaning and life into Adam. And this very eloquently and beautifully illustrates um, what I would call the uh, uh, trickle-down theory of creation. And this is an idea which is so obvious and so convincing that it has occurred to me that it might even be older than our species. What? Well, we're, we're Homo sapiens. But before Homo sapiens, we had Homo habilis, the handyman. Well, not so handy, made some simple, simple stone tools. But even Homo habilis may have had some dim appreciation of the idea that it takes a big, fancy, smart thing to make a stupid thing. You never see a pot making a potter. You never see a horseshoe making a blacksmith. It's always the other way around. Big, fancy, smart things making things that are rather less wonderful than themselves. That's why I call this the trickle-down theory of creation. And as I say, it seems just flat obvious and has for as long as people have been thinking about it. And then along comes Darwin and overturns that idea. Here's a page from a propaganda pamphlet that a student sent me some years ago, the creationist pamphlet. Here we have test two. Do you know of any building that didn't have a builder? Yes, no. Do you know of any painting that didn't have a painter? Yes, no. Do you know of any car that didn't have a maker? Yes, no. If you answered yes for any of the above, give details. <laughs> Take that, you Darwinians. <laughs> what could be more obvious that you couldn't fill in that blank? This perfectly captures the sense of sort of outraged common sense with which many people view Darwin's amazing inversion. Um, some people have thought this test two page is just too good to be true. I went hunting the other day to see if I could find my copy of the pamphlet. And I didn't, but I found a photocopy of another of the pages in it, which I thought I would share with you just because it's so funny. The banana, the atheist's nightmare. <laughs> Note that the banana is shaped for human hand, has non-slip surface, <laughs> has outward indicators of inward contents, green too early, yellow just right, black too late, <laughs> has a tab for removal of wrapper, is perforated on wrapper, biodegradable wrapper, is shaped for mouth, <laughs> has a point at top for ease of entry, <laughs> is pleasing to taste buds, and is curved towards the face to make eating process easy. <laughs> well, any atheists out there who are, who are converted by this, uh, is, uh, but it, it, it too expresses the sense that you can't get these wonderful, wonderful things without a creator that is even more wonderful still. That's the idea. Now we want to compare that, the trickle-down theory of creation, with what we might call the bubble-up theory of creation, which says that wonderful things can actually be created and improved and made better by a process which itself isn't intelligent at all and has no purpose, which is just a mechanistic, mindless, algorithmic sorting process. Now, Here's Darwin's idea itself in Darwin's own words. This is the summary at the end of chapter four of The Origin of Species. And what I'm going to do is simply extract from it by putting in italics the key ideas. Let's just see what he says. I'm not going to read it all, but just the italics. If beings vary at all, that is if they're not all alike, 
And if there be a severe struggle for life, if there's finite resources so that not everybody can have everything that they need, if variations useful to any organic being do occur, that is, if the differences between these individuals are not all neutral, some of them actually provide a benefit of some sort, assuredly, individuals thus characterized will have the best chance of being preserved in the struggle for life. That's practically by definition. And from the strong principle of inheritance, they will tend to produce offspring similarly characterized. The strong principle of inheritance is simply the idea that the offspring will be more like their parents than like their parents' rivals for those resources. If those conditions are met, Darwin says, we're going to have a process of gradual, automatic improvement of the characteristics of those organic beings. And this, he says, is a principle of preservation. This is accumulating design improvements. And he calls it, as he says, for the sake of brevity, natural selection. That's it. That's the idea. Right there. It's not hard to understand, and yet, as has often been observed, it is hard to understand. And people often misunderstand it or draw implications from it it just doesn't have. But right from the outset, some people saw this as not just an interesting, and still at his day somewhat speculative, idea about how organisms got some of their features, but a profound revolution. And my favorite quote was originally published anonymously in a British publication called Athenaeum, which was sort of the New York Review of Books of its day. It was a, a sort of literary intellectual magazine. And this anonymous review, written in high dudgeon, had the following thing to say. In the theory with which we have to deal, absolute ignorance is the artificer so that we may enunciate as the fundamental principle of the whole system that in order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it is not requisite to know how to make it. The capital letters are in the original. This proposition will be found on careful examination to express in condensed form the essential purport of the theory and to express in a few words all Mr. Darwin's meaning who, by a strange inversion of reasoning, seems to think absolute ignorance fully qualified to take the place of absolute wisdom in all the achievements of creative skill. Bingo. He's got it. That's right. He's exactly right. That's the purport of the theory. That absolute ignorance, a process which has no purpose, no intention, no foresight. It's just a mechanical sorting process that this will automatically compete against absolute wisdom. It can do the work that tradition says requires absolute wisdom. Well, one can see that Robert Beverly Mackenzie, I was able to sleuth out his name with the help of a few scholars in England, uh, was in high dudgeon when he wrote this. And in the intervening years, that was 1868, he wrote that, uh, tempers have flared even more. One might pause at this point and say, well, wait a minute, what, what does that idea of Darwin's have to do with the origin of species anyway? It seems to be about very gradual improvement. How do we get the origin of species out of, out of that? Well, here we have to look at one of Darwin's own diagrams. This is the, the the tree of life diagram that's actually in the origin, uh, uh, drawn by Darwin or f drawn uh, for him. And what do we see here? We see a common ancestor that, who has m many offspring, but most of these die without issue. They die childless, no offspring. Um, but here's two that have offspring, and most of them die without offspring, and here's more that have offspring, and so forth, and up you go. And what you see is, thanks to this postulated process of natural selection, 
they grow farther and farther apart, and that's not in space, that's in, in design space, as it were. They, they, they diverge in their characteristics. Uh, enough so that eventually we get a fissioning of lineages into distinct species. Now, this is the tree of life as Darwin envisaged it. What does it look like more than 100 years later? Here is a picture of the tree of life. It's, if it doesn't look like a tree, that's because this is a bird's eye view. We're looking down on the tree of life. This was published in Science a few years ago, and it's already out of date. But the main points are clear. And there's, there's the trunk. There's the root right there. That's where life starts. And the first major fissioning is into the three groups, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya. We are eukarya. That's going to be important a little later. And you can see us. There we are, homo. And Caprinus, that's, that's a mushroom. <laughs> Zea is corn, like popcorn, for instance. And uh, what else have we got here? Well, let's see. Where is a paramecium, which you may remember from high school biology? Uh, and we're crowded way over uh, on this one branch of the tree of life. Uh, and by the way, some of you who are not biologists may not know the archaea. We're not even known about, we're not even imagined as a separate group uh, just a few years ago. So the tree of life, we're learning a great deal about the details of the tree of life. And here we see this extraordinary diversity. That tree of life has produced forms as different as Popcorn and people is different as, as bacteria and redwood trees, and they all have a common ancestor. They all share, we share common ancestors, not just with each other, everybody in the room, and quite recent ones at that. We share a common ancestor with every oak tree, every fish, every bird. Some of those, all of oak trees, fish, and bird, uh, we all share this common ancestor right there. And we share common ancestors with the bacteria that inhabit our gut if we go right back to the very beginning. And we can find those, the clear fossil traces of, those, of that common ancestry in the genes. Yes, we share genes with bacteria. That's how we know we have for sure that we have a common ancestor. Well, all of that design work, all of that laborious improvement and revision of design, R&D, as anybody in industry will tell you, costs both time and energy. And you don't get it for free. In fact, one of the ways of thinking about Darwin's principle of preservation, I sometimes suggest to my students, is it's really, it might be called the principle of plagiarism. If something's valuable, that means it's worth copying and copying, and copying, and copying. And if you can copy it, you don't have to invent it for yourself. So the design accumulates, accumulates, accumulates through this replication process. That's how the system works. But still, all of the design innovations have to come to, and those, tiny though they may be, modest though they may be, they take time and energy to accumulate as well. And so there's a tremendous amount of what I'm going to call design work that has to be done by this mindless process well, it has quite a bit of time. Well, three and a half billion years on this planet is current best estimate. And that's a long time, three and a half billion years. Not million, but billion. But still, it's quite possible to be skeptical and say, I still don't see how all that design work could have been accomplished by such a mindless process. I don't think it's possible. I think there may well be some wonders of the biosphere that are just too wonderful to have been generated by natural selection. A you can't get here from there wonder that could not be the result of a long and gradual sequence of small mindless improvements. I wanted to have a name for such a you can't get here from there thing. And so, since I was envisaging this with the metaphor of work being done and sort of lifting in design space, I called them skyhooks. Here's a skyhook. 
This was a cover, this was a, this was a, a funny picture in the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, and it shows Brunelleschi's dome in Florence. And the, the lantern is being put on top of the dome by a sky hook, as you will notice. Strictly impossible, miraculous. You can't do it that way. But it's particularly nice that the artist chose Brunelleschi's dome because that was an engineering marvel of its day. And in fact, in order to build that dome, Brunelleschi had to design some new kinds, not of miraculous sky hooks, but some new kinds of cranes. Cranes are not miraculous. You can actually design and build them. They have their own R&D history. And once you've got them, they make possible designs that weren't heretofore possible, like Brunelleschi's dome. So if you have a non-miraculous lifter, that's a crane, even if it sort of looks like a skyhook. This picture was sent to me by somebody in England. I can't remember who, but there's, there's, a, there's a, a crane, actually, a flying crane. It's not a skyhook, because my definition of skyhook is a miraculous lifter in design space. In fact, here's what's happened over the last century more of skepticism about evolution. Skeptics have looked again and again trying to find a skyhook, something that just defied any evolutionary explanation. And instead, what's happened again and again is we've discovered cranes. In fact, we've discovered a whole cascade of cranes. A crane is an innovation which itself has to evolve. It has to have its own uh, 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 history of, of evolution, and it has to pay for itself locally. It can't be miraculous. Once it's on the scene, it becomes the occasion for an explosion of ever faster, more efficient, more wonderful exploration of design space. So here's a cascade of cranes. The first is the eukaryotic revolution. The second is sex. You'll be pleased to know that sex is a crane. That's not why it evolved. It didn't evolve in order to make the mixing of genes more efficient and effective, but that's an effect that it has and that permits sexually reproducing lineages to explore design space uh, uh, more vigorously and effectively than non-sexually reproducing species. Multicellularity is a crane because once we get cell differentiation, we get a whole new realm of designs. Uh, you will have noticed bacteria, there's sort of rod-shaped ones and spherical ones and a few other shapes, but that's pretty much it. But if you look around at multicellular us, at our giraffes and our redwood trees and our giant squid and our rabbits and all the rest, you'll see a breathtaking diversity of design which could only happen once multicellularity had evolved. And it had to evolve on its own with an evolutionary history. And it didn't evolve in order to make possible all those designs, but once it did evolve, those designs did become possible. Language is a crane, and the interesting thing about language as a crane is that it's only evolved for one species, us. We're the only species that has a real, really productive language. Other, other species have communication systems with some very interesting features, but nothing as explosive as human natural language. The evolution of language is a hot and vexed topic these days on which there is a great deal of work and not much agreement. Language, of course, makes possible human culture. Art, religion, politics, science, engineering. And these are all cranes, too. They enable us to explore parts of design space that no other species can explore. I want to go back to the first of these, the prokaryotic invasion, because it turns out to have some features in common with cultural, the cultural crane. On the left, you see a simple prokaryote, like a bacterium. And you'll just notice, just visually, it's much simpler than the, than the, the organism on the right, which is a eukaryote. 
eukaryotic cells, well, you're a eukaryote, that is to say, your cells are eukaryotic, which means, you, well, I don't know, let's see, you have in the neighborhood of 10 trillion eukaryotic cells in your body, and another 90 trillion symbiotic visitors, and a lot of those are prokaryotes themselves. It's a lot of cells. What happened is this. Before there were any eukaryotes, there were just prokaryotes. And one day, many millions of years ago, actually billions of years ago, several billion years ago, one prokaryote entered the body of another prokaryote. Well now, was this an attack, an invasion, or was this being eaten? Well, if this one dissolves this one and reuses the parts, that's being eaten. If instead it forms a sort of sack around it and leaves it pretty much untouched, then it's been invaded. And in fact, what happened on this case was that it was an invasion that was tolerated, and it created a new thing, and a prokaryote with another prokaryote inside it that was fitter than either prokaryote on their own. By joining forces, they made something which had some capacity that neither one had on their own. That's how it paid for itself. And once it got started, it got carried along through the offspring of this new, more complicated critter, the eukaryotic cell. There are plenty of fossil traces of this now. As I said, you're a eukaryote, and every cell in your body has two, actually more than two, but it has two separate genomes. It has one genome in the nucleus. That's your nuclear DNA. That's, that's your genome proper in a certain sense. And then it has its mitochondrial DNA. And this is, these are distinct lineages. The mitochondrial DNA you get only from your mother, who got it from her mother, who got it from her mother, all the way back. This is clear evidence, and there's much more, that, that this was the source of the eukaryotic cell. It's interesting, just as a matter of etymology, eu is the Greek suffix, it means good, as in euphemism. A eukaryotic cell, it's better. It's a more wonderful thing than a prokaryote, which is an earlier sort of cell. We still have plenty of prokaryotes around, all those bacteria are prokaryotes. But the eukaryotes, because they're more complicated, can begin to specialize. If you've got lots of parts, then you can expand some of those parts at the expense of others, and then you can begin to develop a specialization, and then you can get together with another eukaryote, which has a different specialization, and now you can make a larger conglomeration. You're on your road to multicellularity. All of your cells, but think how different they are. You've got nerve cells, blood cells, bone cells, brain cells. You've got lots of different kinds of cells. They're all basically the same, they're all eukaryotic cells, but they've developed many different specializations. And that couldn't happen without the eukaryotic revolution first. So here's our cascade of cranes. By the way, at around the same time I was writing about this, a wonderful book was published by one of my favorite evolutionary biologists, John Maynard Smith, writing with the uh, Hungarian uh, scientist, Ursh Zathmeri, The Major Transitions in Evolution. And each one of those major transitions is one of my cranes. So if you're a biologist and you know about John Maynard Smith's work, then you have a simple translation of my term crane. It's a, it's a Maynard Smith, Zath Mary transition. From this perspective, we can begin to look at the fruits of the tree of life and see them a bit differently. On the left we see a beaver dam, on the right we see Hoover Dam. They are both fruits on the tree of life. Neither one is alive. Both are artifacts made by living things. 
And they're both quite complicated and they serve rather the same function. But the ways in which they're built and the R&D that went into them are of course remarkably different in many regards. But they both find their place as products of the tree of life. In fact, products of the tree of life delivered by two species, homo sapiens and beavers, which are actually quite close together. We're, we're both mammals after all. A spider web is another kind of artifact created by a living thing. And the internet or the power grid in a city is another artifact. Similarly, could not exist if it was not the product of the activity of some living thing which was itself a fruit on the tree of life. One more example, we have on the left a bird's nest, in this case an oriole, and on the right we have no Ode to a Nightingale, the poem. Both artifacts created by living vertebrates, very different in many regards, but also similar in some very important regards. I know that many skeptics about evolution have said to me something like this, well, yeah, 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 I see how natural selection can explain the Oriole's wing. I can see how it can explain a bird. But I don't see how it can explain poetry. To which I want to reply, wait a minute, you think a poem is a more wonderful thing than a bird? You think, yeah, a mindless process can design a bird, but can't design a poem? Either you don't know much about birds, or you have a very inflated sense of how wonderful a poem is. <laughs> poems are wonderful, and there's huge differences between birds' nests and poems, and I'll be trying to get to them, but they're both fruits on the tree of life. And here's another sort of fruit on the tree of life. This is, this is genetic engineering at work. On the left, you see an obese mouse. And on the right, you see a tobacco plant that glows in the dark because it's had firefly genes spliced into its genome. But notice that it, too, is a fruit of the tree of life. It's one which involves the activity of Homo sapiens, but as I was telling you, culture and engineering and science creates new cranes, which makes possible the exploration of new parts of design space. How long would it take for a tobacco plant that glows in the dark to evolve without human help? Maybe it never would. Human help means that we can now explore parts of design space that were not, act, not even accessible a short time ago. That's the nature of this process of evolution. It keeps enlarging both the space of possibilities and the techniques for exploring them. And I know many of you will want to say at this point, but no, no, you, there's something wrong here. We are different. Our minds and our culture are not fruits on Darwin's tree of life. I have an answer to this, and it's simple. No. <laughs> but now I'm going to expand on my answer. But first I want to show you an example of this kind of thinking, because it's very common and very respected. And it's one of those collision zones that we face because we didn't have the Swedish service, the civil service there to design the introduction of Darwinian thinking to our planet. Here's the late Pope John Paul II, in his famous 1996 address, which is often cited by biologists as the address in which the, the Pope said that evolution was a fact, not a theory, and so he does. But he also says this in the same paper. Theories of evolution which, in accordance with the philosophies inspiring them, consider the spirit as emerging from the forces of living matter, or as a mere epiphenomenon of this matter, are incompatible with the truth about man. In other words, yes for the bird, no for the human spirit. Nor are they able to ground the dignity of the person. And this, I think, is key. What 
do you suppose the Pope had in mind when he thought of the dignity of the person? I don't think it's very hard to see. He had in mind that we, human beings, unlike birds and beavers and giraffes and whales, we're moral agents. We have responsibility in a way that no other creature on this planet does. We are also recognizers and appreciators of beauty in a way which apparently far outstrips the appreciation of beauty of other species. And we're recognizers of truth. In other words, we have minds. We have a special sort of spirit, to use the Pope's word. And it is entirely natural and familiar for people to say, that part of the biosphere cannot have evolved. We must have an exception here. We've got to have a skyhook. There are many people who want a skyhook for human culture, for ethics, for epistemology, for poetry, for art, for morality. That's the only place they want to put a skyhook. And I'm saying, no skyhooks. We don't need skyhooks because we've got cranes. So what I want to do is try to show you how we can get to a whole dignified person. Not with any skyhooks, not with any miracles, but with another, with a cascade of cranes. And to do this, I have to give you a first very unsettling analogy. You're out in the meadow and you see a blade of grass and you notice that there's an ant climbing up the blade of grass. Climbs up the blade of grass and then it falls and it climbs and it falls. And it climbs again and you think, my gosh, this is like the myth of Sisyphus. It just keeps climbing up that blade of grass. Why is the ant doing this? What's in it for the ant? And you might wonder, well, maybe it's looking around to see where the food is or maybe it's showing off for its mates. Who knows, maybe it's just exercising, building up its muscles. If you think that way, you're simply missing another possibility because no benefit accrues to the ant climbing up, expending all of this energy climbing up the blade of grass. None at all. What, you mean it's just a fluke? Yes, in fact, it's a fluke. It's a brain fluke, a lancet fluke, dicrocelium dendriticum. This is a little parasite, a little parasitic worm that has crawled into the ant's brain because it has to get into the belly of a cow or a sheep to complete its reproductive cycle and it improves its odds by getting up high on a blade of grass where it's more apt to be eaten. So while salmon are beating their brains out, struggling up streams to reproduce, Dicrocelium dendriticum simply commandeers a passing ant and drives it like an all-terrain vehicle up a blade of grass and hopes for the best. Except, of course, that Dicrocelium dendriticum can't hope. It's a mindless little, it doesn't even have a nervous system. It's a mindless little shred of life. But that's what it's doing. And the benefit is to its reproductive success, not to the ant. It's not the only case. Let me give you one more. I have several, but this is, this is an interesting one. Um, uh, Toxoplasma gondii is a, is a parasite that, that affects uh, rats and mice, and it has to get into the belly of a cat in order to continue its reproductive cycle. So what do you suppose the adaptation in Toxoplasma gondii is that gives it a better chance of getting into the belly of a cat. The rats become fearless. The mice become bold. They run out in the open where they are much more likely to be eaten by cats. Another case, there's also fish that swim up to the surface where the birds that have to eat the parasites in them for those parasites to carry on. There's other cases. In other words, what we have here is a hijacker, a parasite that infects the brain and induces suicidal behavior on behalf of a cause other than one's own genetic fitness. 
spooky. Gee, uh, does that ever happen to us? Well, I would like to remind you the word Islam means submission. But not just that. It means surrender of self-interest to the will of Allah. It means Allah's benefit is of more important to me than myself, my life, whether I have kids, and so forth. But of course it's not just Islam, it's also Christianity. This is a poor photograph of a parchment page of music that I found in a Paris bookstall oh, about 50 years ago. And it dates from about 1540. And it's sort of fun to, to get the reading. It is, Semen est verbum dei sator autem Christus, omnis qui audit eum manebit in eternum. Semen est verbum dei sator autem Christus. The word of God is a seed, and the sower of the seed is Christ. What's in it for the vector? Omnis qui audit eum manebit in eternum. You get, for spreading the word, you get eternal life. It's a nice benefit thrown in there. These are ideas to die for. Islam, Catholicism, other branches of Christianity. But there are also non-religious ideas to die for. There's communism. Many, many people in the last century went to their deaths happily and proudly, dying for an idea instead of hanging around and having children. Democracy. Many others have died for democracy or for justice or for freedom. For freedom? Really? Yes, absolutely. Even my neighboring state. <laughs> Live free or die. Now, You yourself, I dare say, share this attitude about ideas to die for. But let's find out. How many of you think the most important thing you can do with your life is have more grandchildren and great-grandchildren than anybody else? Not a single hand goes up. Sure, you care for your kids and your grandkids. But that's not the summum bonum of your life. You think there's more important things to devote your time and energy to than just making more like you. But think, you're the only, we're the only species that does anything like this. For every other species, the reproductive imperative, that's it. That's the highest goal that can be conceived. Not us. We have become invaded by ideas that we submit ourselves to and treat the furthering of the fate of those ideas as more important even than our own lives. So no other species does it, but it does have a biological explanation. It has to have a biological explanation. It too is a fruit on the tree of life. Now, in order to understand this, I want to remind you a little bit more about gradualism. Consider the following sentence. Every mammal has a mammal for a mother. You agree? It seems almost definitive of what it is to be a mammal. To be born of mammal. Well, there have only been a finite number of mammals, right? Now we have a contradiction. It cannot be that both of these propositions are true. Just a mathematical fact. So something has to give. What's going to give? Good question. One possibility is we might imagine what I will call the prime mammal. This is the first mammal. And it didn't have a mammal for a mother. And it is the mother of all mammals. This is a possibility. It had a therapsid for a mother. Therapsids were those weird things that were intervening between the, between the reptiles and the mammals. And the transition from therapsid to mammal was, of course, very gradual in many regards. And we might ask ourselves, where do we draw the line and identify the prime mammal? 
But then again, we might say, life's short, why bother? We don't have to draw the line. What we can see is that there's a transition from therapsid to mammal, and we don't have to worry about exactly which one is the first and why. We can do the same thing, we can see the same phenomenon in, uh, synchronously in time if we look, for instance, at the interesting case of herring gulls and lesser black-backed gulls. We see a herring gull on the left and a lesser black-backed gull on the right. And let me show you a neat thing about where they are. If you start here in the British Isles, you have both species. That's where their names were given to them, and they are distinguishable and quite readily distinguishable. You have two species of birds. As you cross over to, to Iceland and to southern Greenland and into northern Canada, um, you find um, um, herring gulls too, uh, uh, but, but none of the uh, uh, lesser black-backed gulls. But they're a little bit different. And as you keep going around the North Pole and get into Siberia and coming back, by the time you get back down to the British Isles, you realize that there's a continuity. That the lesser black-backed gulls of England are kin to lesser black-backed gulls in Finland and Siberia. And as you go around, you realize, well, do you have one species here or two? You have a ring species, and it doesn't really make much difference which way you describe it. The ones in the British Isles, they don't mate with each other, so they, they meet what seems to be the standard definition for being different species. And yet, as you go around the North Pole, you can get mating all the way around, showing a little failure of transitivity. What I want to say, in other words, is beware of prime mammals. It's not a good idea. We don't need prime mammals. We don't need to stop our regresses by finding a first one as long as we understand the nature of gradual change. And what we want to do is replace the foundation with the bootstrap. How are we going to do that? Well, bootstrapping, the very term is, is, is sort of comical because it suggests something that's impossible, pick, picking yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's something you can't do. That's a skyhook, is it not? Well. Literally, that's a skyhook, but there's a, there's a perfectly real phenomenon which is called bootstrapping, which is not miraculous at all, and it happens all the time, and it can happen again. I'm going to give you a cultural example. Making a straight edge. Suppose you want to make a straight edge. What do you do? You want to draw a straight line. Well, you go to the drawer, and you get out your ruler, and you put the pencil on it, and you make the line. That's what you do. Where'd you get the straight edge, though? Where'd you get the ruler? Well, you got it from the hardware store. Where'd they get it? They got it from a straight edge manufacturer. Where did they get it? Well, of course, they had to have a standard straight edge at which to do the quality control on the straight edges that they were going to sell. Where did they get that? If you go back and look at the history of straight edges, you realize it's quite an interesting chapter in, in engineering history. And we go back far enough, we get to the early days when they were shoving great big blocks of stone against other great big blocks of stone and grinding, mutually grinding them to get a really straight, flat surface. And it is from such activities as that, where they had pretty darn straight edges, that they got going, and then they got better and better and better and better and better straight edges. And now they got some really good ones. Here's a photograph of a so-called box straight edge, and it's uh, got many physical properties that make it a valuable straight edge. It would be the standard against which you would then make your machine tools and so forth. And here's a diagram that shows what happens if you look at a straight edge magnified uh, a million times. If you're looking at the surface, and you see it's not really straight. It's quite jagged. And we can even, you see, define higher standards of straightness than we can make. This is a process of bootstrapping, which has gotten us to the point where we can conceive of perfectly straight edges, and we can measure our current candidates against them. And we did this all without any skyhook straight edge. We built it up gradually. So language and culture, then, are two of the cranes that themselves have spawned further cranes. And I want to say a little bit more about how this happened. 
Symbionts are life forms like that prokaryote that, that landed inside another prokaryote that live with other creatures. And the invaders in the prokaryotic invasions were not parasites, but what are called mutualists. That is, they were, they, they were beneficial to each other. In fact, the standard terminology says that symbionts can be divided into parasites proper. Those are the ones that are bad for your fitness, that actually are, uh, are deleterious to your fitness, such as Dicrocelium dendriticum, which doesn't do the ant any good at all. In fact, leads to its early demise. Then we have mutualists, which enhance host fitness, such as many of the flora in your gut that you couldn't live without. Be very grateful you have those symbionts. And then there are the commensals, which are just neutral. They don't really hurt you, they don't really help you. You know, athlete's foot, stuff like that. I suppose that has to count as a parasite. It's really, really doesn't, it's not neutral with regard to your fitness. But it's not, it's not like HIV. Now, what I want to suggest is that something very similar to the prokaryotic revolution happened when we got culture. That a certain group of hominoids, their brains got invaded by some symbiont visitors that Richard Dawkins calls memes. These are items of culture that then reproduce ideas. The resulting hominoid, his head packed with replicating ideas, was fitter than the uninfected cousin. So now, just as with the eukaryotic cell, we've made a teamwork, a new kind of organism. We might call it a person. Because it had all these complicated passengers, ideas, it could specialize, making possible multi-person groups that could organize and accomplish things that individuals could not on their own. So we're retelling the same story that we told in the birth of multicellularity through the birth of the eukaryotic revolution, and we're retelling the same story at the cultural level now, saying that this is what language and culture gives us. Of course, language is composed of words, and words are memes. They have their own history, they evolve, and they evolve whether or not people care. The pronunciation and the meanings of words drifts over time. And thank goodness we have them. They make a lot of things possible that wouldn't otherwise be possible. Create civilization, more culture, more science, more technology. This is the mimetic revolution. Well. Has it really enhanced human fitness? Are these mutualists? Well, Paul McCready, the uh, visionary engineer, has an interesting calculation. He calculates that 10,000 years ago on this planet, this is around the time of the birth of agriculture, human population plus their livestock and pets was approximately a tenth of a percent of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. So we're not including the plants, of course, and we're not including what's in, the, what's in the seas. We're just the terrestrial vertebrate biomass that us, our ancestors, plus their livestock and pets was about a tenth of a percent. Anybody like to hazard a guess of what the percentage would be today? 20, 30, 40? No guesses? 70, 85? 55. 55. 98. We swamp the non-domesticated vertebrates. We swamp them. This is what McCready has to say about it. Such a powerful statement, I decided to quote it in full. Over billions of years on a unique sphere, Chance has painted a thin covering of life, complex, improbable, wonderful, and fragile. Suddenly, we humans, a recently arrived species, no longer subject to the checks and balances inherent in nature, have grown in population, technology, and intelligence to a position of terrible power. We now wield the paintbrush. And all of that was made possible by the mimetic, the cultural revolution. Well, how did it begin? Did language come before religion? Did religion come first? Did they co-evolve? 
Where did science fit in? Later than religion, that's for sure. What primed the pump? My book, Breaking the Spell, asks these questions and discusses answers. It does not answer them, but it discusses what it will take to answer them properly. And I'm just going to give you a few ideas, a couple of ideas from it. The wild memes of folk religion are in effect the pigeons, squirrels, and rats of human culture. Pigeons and squirrels and rats are not domesticated species, they're wild species, but they have evolved to live in close proximity to us to, and to benefit from us. We, don't, we do not take care of them, we do not own them, but we cohabit the world with them in close proximity. Words are like that. Languages are like that. They're wild memes. Yes, there are language mavens, there are grammarians and scolds and people who say you mustn't use the word ain't and so forth, but they're not necessary. Languages can take care of themselves just the way squirrels can. You don't have to protect them. They're, they're well evolved to live with us and reproduce on their own. And so are languages, so are words. But what happened, I claim, is that some of the wild memes of religion, of folk religion, got domesticated. They acquired stewards. And that creates, created organized religion and changed everything. Think about sheep. How clever it was of sheep to acquire shepherds. <laughs> Look what they did. They outsourced their main problems, their food, their protection. They gave up free mating, in return for which they got a tremendous fitness boost from being domesticated. You could cart off their wild ancestors on a few arcs today, but there's billions of them. Good bargain for them. How clever. But of course it wasn't the sheep's cleverness, was it? Sheep are pretty stupid. And they are no more knowledgeable about this than Dicrocelium dendriticum, that little worm that crawled into the ant's brain. This is not the worm's cleverness, it's not the sheep's cleverness, it's the cleverness of evolution. This is, Francis Crick once as a joke invented what he called Orgel's second rule. Evolution is cleverer than you are. That doesn't mean intelligent design. In fact, on the contrary, evolution is a perfectly unintelligent process, but it is breathtakingly good at finding brilliant solutions to problems that have their own rationales, what I call the free-floating rationales of evolution. And that is how we can explain in evolutionary terms how culture arrives and makes us into the dignified idea-having, idea-loving, idea-worshipping people that we are. Now, here's something you may have seen before. This is the Darwin fish, uh, and it is, of course, a play on the Christian fish. And written here on the Christian fish is the Greek word ichthys, which is the Greek word for fish. And that's why the Christian symbol is the fish. And this was the first acronym. Some of you may know this, because the letters here stand for Jesus Christos Theon Hios Soter, Jesus Christ, God, Son, and Savior. So that's, this was the first acronym. That's why we use the fish. So one day, a few years ago, I was at an evolution conference, and the physicist, Murray Gell-Mann, came up to me, and I was wearing a little Darwin pin, a Darwin fish pin. And he said, Dan, uh, you know about the fish, ichthys acronym. I said, yes, yes, I've heard that before. He says, what I want to know, Dan, is what does D-A-R-W-I-N stand for? <laughs> and I thought about it. I said, give me a minute, Murray. I'm going to go get a cup of coffee and think it over. Well, as you can tell, I don't really have Greek, but we philosophers are supposed to have some Latin. And I had my leftover high school Latin, so I sat down and thought about it for a while. And then I realized this was going to be difficult because there's no W in, uh, in Latin. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But this is what I came up with, and ever since then it's been my motto. 
delere auctorum rerum ut universum W <laughs> infinitum noscas, which translates destroy the author of things in order to understand the infinite universe. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>